Yesterday, all the internet seemed so far away. Now they're presented live before your face. Oh, yesterday was Jupiter at night. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Jupiter at Night. My name is Chris. My name is Jeremy. Hey there, Jay, man. You know Hi. what we're talking about tonight? Uh, could it be old video games? No, not oh. old video games. Okay. We're going to be talking about rocks, space oh, rocks right. in particular. Things floating through space. Well, you know, we like to be timely here on Jupiter at Night. We thought we we'd have a fun episode because, well, we got kind of heavy. That was fun. Uh, oh! <laughs> died. <laughs> Damn. Oh, did it again! Damn, it died. You, for longtime viewers of Jupiter Broadcasting, you might know by now that Chris is very bad at video games. Damn. Just more evidence. Yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> it hurt, you know what the problem is? I'm always trying to do them during the shows. Yeah. I got to learn to just maybe try it on my own. Well, actually, this week turns out to be a very active week for rocks in space in a few different ways. So we thought we got to talk about it. Yeah, well, this week is the peak of this year's Leonid meteor shower. Yeah. All during the early morning hours, all this week, over the next several days, are the absolute best times to watch the uh, space dust Blow up on impact. Burn in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Burn, baby, burn. And yes, you get the streaks and all that kind of cool stuff. It's really cool. You know, actually, I've never seen it. Oh, I've never watched a meteor shower. That. You see, you've okay. Now, I've seen like videos and stuff like that. Uh, for people that don't know, kind of the irony of that situation is, is you actually live in a great place to view the sky, as in there's no yes city no. lights. Yes, a around. great place to watch the, you know, to look up at the stars. Yeah. But unfortunately, the meteor shower comes in at such an angle. I'm surrounded by oh, trees. Oh, you can't see. I it? can't actually see it that from sucks, my place. Dude. Plus, you know what? I don't want to wake up at four in the morning to watch this crap. Uh, That's no. the best time to watch it is after the moon has set. Let's be honest. We would just stay up an extra hour too. Well, Come yeah. on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard. I'm a night owl. You're you're well. I don't oh, even. I'm you're nocturnal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, okay. Before we jump in, I just want to say I actually had the fortune of during my high school years growing up in a location where I did have a very wide open field, mm -hmm. and so I could see a lot of the sky. And it's funny because now that I live in more of a rural area where there's lights and street lights and all that stuff. It's really rare that I get to see that kind of sky. Yeah. So I specifically, when I'm home during the holidays, like times like right now, November, it's mm -hmm. dark outside early. And if I'm doing a family thing like Thanksgiving or something like that and we leave and the sky is clear, I always stop it. And I just got to check it out because it's just, it's a real treat. And that these kind of weekends. And are you like me? You kind of like geek out on the vastness of oh, it all dude. a little bit? Yeah, you got to trip Kind of trip out a little? <laughs> well, I'm a long time Star Trek fan. Of so course. So that makes you think big. And then, yeah. you know, my grandpa used to always talk about space with me all the time. And he would talk about that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always like to just kind of go there and... And then usually my wife starts, you know, poking me in the ribs. Right. Get out of here. Let's go. <laughs> what are you like, looking at? Yeah. What are you staring <laughs> off at? So if you, you know, if you do get the opportunity and you are a, even, you don't actually have to be looking at 4 a.m. Sometimes no, you know, I know. it starts, yeah. you might just take a peek out and see. It's just the best time because that's after the moon has gone down. It's the darkest that the sky ah, will be. Yeah. Gotcha. So most likely you'll see something. It, the whole reason that I would look at and watch the meteor shower is just to kind of remind me of the vastness of space that this... This meteor shower is caused by a stellar object that only passes our way once every 33 years. Yeah, that's really crazy. Uh, that, it, that means its orbit is, you know, at least 33 times the size of our orbit, which is already a vast distance from our sun. Mm -hmm. In fact, the orbit of this um, comet is so wide that people lose it. When it's on its outer edges, and people have thought that they rediscover or discovering a new <laughs> comet as it comes back into yeah. range. And they're like, oh, cool. I found it. Oh, Wait, nope. that's the same <laughs> I guess those hunks of rocks do kind of probably look alike. Yeah. Okay. Now I've heard this before, but and I didn't have a chance to find a clip of it before the show. Mm -hmm. But there is, um, there are clips you can find online, probably on I don't know YouTube or something. But these meteor showers and things like that, they actually put out radio signals that you can pick up, so mm -hmm. you can actually hear them. And it, it, it doesn't sound exactly like it, but it almost does sound like something burning up in a way. It fizzles mm -hmm. out, and it's this. It sounds like a, a radio transmission. It, well, that it sounds like out. it starts with a zip and then it ends in static. It's yeah. just like you might imagine the sound of something entering the atmosphere. Yeah. One of the <clears throat> weirdest things about this whole meteor shower, though, is that people think of it as rocks yeah, flying I, through yeah. into our atmosphere, but yeah. it's not. The largest fragment ever recorded to come off the yeah. fr in from the Leonid meteor shower is about the size of a marble. Oh, that's the largest. And that still burns. You Most can still of see it that is, burn, huh? is just dust particles. Oh, uh, just built up around it and mm -hmm. stuff. So no, the actual... it's just it's just dust, a single particle of dust, because oh, it hits oh, our oh. atmosphere going so gotcha. freaking fast yeah. 
that it yeah. compresses all of the air in front of it and lights that air on fire right, as right, it comes in. Right. 160,000 miles per hour, those things enter Whoa. our atmosphere. Wow. 160,000? 160,000 miles an hour. For comparison, you know, like a rifle yeah. is about 2,000. <laughs> and those bullets are fast. Man. <laughs> so those dusts are like probably faster than Superman. Interesting. Probably. He's faster than a speeding bullet, but how much faster? Yeah. Is yeah. it that much faster? When you, you know, because they don't say faster than a speeding piece of they space They don't say a, a, faster than a Leonid meteor shower. Now, wasn't there, wasn't there a <laughs> rock that just missed us? Um, well, by just... It's like 25,000 miles. But, you know, that seems like an astronomically, yeah. that's funny, large figure. But really, that's less than the distance to the moon. Yeah, well... It's okay. like one-tenth of the or distance to the moon. take the International Space Station. I think that's like 215 miles above the Earth. Right. So it's quite a ways out there. So, but still, boy, Did imagine, you know, imagine you know, the view I was reading about the space that. station. I was reading about that near miss yeah. asteroid, which, yeah. by the way, wouldn't have done anything if it hit us, so don't panic. No, it was it only was, like 10 feet... It's like eight and a half feet long. Oh, okay. That would have totally burned up. Yeah. I hope. Completely Maybe. fragmented and burned up. But if not, there's a pretty good chance it would something hit Something else I picked up. <laughs> pretty good chance. Or Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something else I learned from that article. Or Australia. Though, we have, as- we have uh, satellites orbiting up to 200,000 feet up. Whoa. That's, that's hella out there. Now, do you have any idea? Do they, do they launch them? Up to certain, and then the, do the satellite propel themselves? Do you know? I have no idea. I'd be really curious to know. I'm about not that. a satellite expert. If you know how that works, leave us a comment. Do they actually have to drive that orbiting satellite all the way up to that orbit, or does do they just yeah? Do they it launch there? it and then just wait until it orbits out? Yeah, like because you could just do that with thrust, right? Just like right. turns and stuff. Or do they do they actually drive it all the way up there and then just break? <laughs> How does that work? Leave us a comment. Space breaks. If you know, I'd like I'd like to know. You know, one of the neatest things to happen regarding asteroids and space and everything very Lay recently me, is, you know, uh, Japan just started their space program very yeah. recently. Yeah. And one of their very first missions was to go out and visit uh, an asteroid. Dude, Amazing. that's ambitious. Yeah. Out of the gate, they're like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go touch another object in space. Not just that, but then get a sample and return the sample. To Earth. That's nuts. I don't know. Uh, some of you might out there that are interested in space might have followed the mission. You know that it had its own share of lumps. It almost failed several times. Yeah. In fact, when they were supposed to gracefully land on the asteroid, they basically just pounded directly into it. Now, you remember, what was it, back in 2008, <coughs> we launched uh, Deep Impact or something like that, where we mm-hmm. actually intentionally slammed into it yep. and then had, had something hanging back that, that collected. Right. Now, but their intention was to gracefully boop, 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 land. Boop, 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 Drill, drill in, there, in take and then a sample. relaunch. Yeah, but they hit it pretty hard. Well, they got lucky that the relaunching mechanism was not damaged on the So they the did impact. smash into it pretty good. Yep. And then they weren't sure if the dust they collected was from the rock or... Or from re-entry yeah. or on the yeah. the path to or fro, but... But they looked, they, you know, they... I, I don't know. Oh, oh, actually. So this is interesting, dude. I was reading about this story before mm-hmm. the show, and, and they're like, yeah, there's dust in there, and they're not sure where it's from. And I'm like, crap, well, how do they figure out how that dust is from the asteroid or if it's from Earth. Mm -hmm. You know how they figured it out? What? They found elements in there that aren't from Earth. That don't exist. They just don't exist on here. Earth, and they're like, "Oh, well, that's probably a pretty good indication that's from space, <laughs> unless you know the the space probe itself yeah. created it yeah. at some point." <laughs> but what are these? Either atoms? way, that's a win. What know? are they? Uh, it's some sort of sulfur dioxide or something that's what like it sounded that. Sounded like, but some sort of combination. Something that we use and we could probably create in a lab, but it's not a naturally occurring element on our planet. But now that now that doesn't doesn't that seem like a video game to you? Like. Okay, so part one of the video game is you get you get one object and you get another object, and now you can combine them and make your own object. But at a certain point, they just all of a sudden just let you get a combined version of that object, mm-hmm. a better gun, like you know, by visiting a nearby asteroid. Yeah, for example, like in Star <laughs> Trek Online right now, I have a gun, and then I have a I have like something applied to my guy that gives me a buff that makes my gun better. Mm-hmm. And then as I get further along, I'll just get a better gun. Right now. Maybe we can go out and just find crap in space that we already go through a bunch of trouble to combine stuff and make. We like can just find these elements in space. Antimatter? And just have them. Yeah. Like antimatter. And that's something they're working on with the Large Hydrin, large hydrin Collider. Well, at hey, CERN, John. at the same laboratory. Oh, these are the guys that, the same people that looked at this dust? No, no. That's, oh. that's Japan, dude. Oh, yeah, okay. That's not, that's I know, not so important what, what laboratory people. It's just Japan. No, about. CERN. Yeah. You know, know, where the Large Hadron Collider is. Where they're going to destroy everything. Uh huh. They recently actually, I should add this link to our show notes, but they recently managed to contain anti hydrogen. Up to 82 particles of it, I think, is what they estimated. Anti hydrogen is the same thing as antimatter? 
It is a form of antimatter. Ah. It is the antithesis of hydrogen. Oh, which, right. So if combined with hydrogen, would annihilate and create so massive amounts of energy. we have antiversions of all that kind of stuff? Like, well, yeah. S- like carbon? Well, you know, we hydrogen, anti-carbon? hydrogen has a specific molecular structure. Yeah. If you give it an <clears throat> anti-charge, it becomes anti-hydrogen. So anything... Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Wow. So you could have anti-carbon, anti-gold, anti-whatever. And I wonder if the different... It's because the different anti-things might have different levels of... Mm-hmm. Explosion if they combine, if they meet. different efficiency levels. Yeah, yeah. So you could have like an antimatter for your car, and then you could have an antimatter for your spaceship, and that'd be like the high grade <laughs> stuff. And it'd be like at the, at the antimatter premium. gas station. Yeah. <laughs> premium would be like good molecules. Or I don't know. You know that crap. You know they come from the same t- tank, and then they just drop it. Here we'll throw a few more premium molecules in there, and then a few more premium anti ones. <laughs> Stir it all up. They'll never know. That's what we have to look forward to, and then they, and then they just keep. <laughs> Raising the price. Dude, oil spills in the future are going to be disastrous. Oh, man. <laughs> that's going to take some S out. Yeah. That's going to be a whole new game. <laughs> okay, so that's really fascinating. That's ex- it is. That's extremely cool stuff. I mean, their efficiency is way down, and it still takes massive amounts of energy yeah. to create this stuff. But if they can refine their methods to the point that they're able to contain large quantities of then antimatter. Could they use that to make more? I, I don't know. I mean, Maybe theoretically, like the because you use them, fire. and when you use them, they create a lot of energy. Yeah. If you can harness that energy to create more, Dude. maybe? I don't know. I'm no scientist. Nuclear uh, power I'm just, just famous on so the old internet. school now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. I combine different molecules, ones that are anti-charged. anti-charged. And, yeah. It's wow. like Star Trek. Oh, my God. What would pie and anti-pie be like? That would be a, like a flavor explosion. <laughs> so that much c- pie energy. That could be incredible. <laughs> Yeah, check out my new car. It runs off pie and anti-pie. <laughs> it smells delicious. <laughs> man, I can't wait for the future. Oh, and you man. know what happens? We're going to cover it right here on Jupiter Night. And you can catch it all live on the internet. Yeah. Tuesday through Thursday at 8 p.m. Pacific. Whoa. Where at? At jupiterbroadcasting.com slash live. I like it. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for watching tonight's episode of Jupiter at Night. And we'll see you tomorrow.